So we are going to pre-record our intro, so we could just go ahead and and start. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the M14 Podcast. We have with us my friend and, and my old command master chief, Tomas Garcia. How you doing again today, brother? Hey, bro. I'm doing well. Thanks. Uh, and thanks for having me. Uh, it's, uh, it's awesome to see you guys again. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited to do this with you guys. Yeah, thanks so much for being on with us. Uh, before we get started, let's go ahead and take a break from a word from our sponsors. All right, welcome back, everybody. Again, E14 Podcast with us today is Command Master Chief Tomas Garcia. Tell so, us a little about yourself, Tomas. Can you tell us how long you've been in the Navy, kind of where you got started and stuff? Yeah, sure. Uh, I uh, enlisted out of uh, South Texas, a little town called Bishop. Um, it's right next to uh, Kingsville, Texas. Uh, uh, it was influenced by the Naval Air Station there in Kingsville. Uh, my dad was a career firefighter there for over 25 years. Um, so, you know, military is all I wanted to do um, coming out of high school. So, you know, I, I tried to follow my dad's steps in the, in the Air Force, but that, that didn't work out. You know, the Air Force recruiters weren't there or, or you know, they were, they were full. So um, mm -hmm. the, Navy, the Navy guy got me and uh, I, I really wanted to go aviation um, because of the Naval Air Station in Teensville. I thought it'd be really cool to join the Navy and be stationed at home. Um, and when I got to the MEPS, they, they talked to me about submarines and I absolutely <laughs> fell in love with the idea of it. Um, so God bless that classifier and, and the hard That's work. That's the opposite. There the MEPS. So yeah, it's extreme opposite, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, imagine my mom's surprise when I came home and she's expecting me to tell her about a five year AT contract for aviation and electronics. And I tell her I, I joined for six years in the submarine electronics community. Um, yeah, I, I think she slapped me, but I'm not sure. I know she cried and that, you know, it broke my heart. Um, but I knew that's what I want to do uh, from the get go. I, you know, the goal was 20 years, uh, go as far as the Navy would let me go. And uh, I've, um, like I said, we started on the submarine community and I absolutely fell in love with the submarine community, the missions, the operations that we did from, you know, everything from you know, deploying uh, SEAL teams to uh, intelligence or surveillance uh, operations with, with battle groups. Uh, just the operations and the versatility of the submarine community just, you know, just it captured me. Um, so then I just wanted to go as far as I could in that community. Uh, ended up serving set, uh, 24 years as um, a career submariner. I went from you know ET3 all the way to uh, ETCM. Uh, when I wait, made senior chief, I, I took on the role as the chief of the boat, um, which for those people that aren't uh, uh, knowledgeable of the submarine community. The chief of the boat is our command master chief on submarines. So in 2008, started that tour um, and absolutely fell in love with um, helping junior sailors. So, you know, at that point in my career, it wasn't about electronics anymore as much as it was people maintenance. And I, you know, helping people, helping sailors and, you know, the, their, their progression just, it, 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 it captured me. And it's, it's what I, you know, who I am and, and what I'm all about. Uh, so I moved my way up through Cobb on submarines and, um, you know, there's, there's only a certain amount of tours they let you serve as a Cobb and then they say, all right, you should, maybe you got to find a new, a new uh, <laughs> a lifestyle. What are you going to do next? And so I, I threw my name in the, in the hat for command mass sheet program. I got selected. Um, and then that, that took me a, a whole nother route. You know, I ended up at in my hometown, believe it or not. So you know, that, that ET3 or AT3 that want to get stationed at home um, got to do it um, only as a command master chief of the base there in Kingsville. So that was a, an amazing opportunity for me. And then after that, uh, I, I found myself in the recruiting world. I uh, did th two years out in San Jose as the CMC for Navy Recruiting District, San Francisco, that turned into uh, NTAG Golden Gate. And then uh, mm -hmm. I ended up uh, at Region uh, West as a command master chief for all of Navy recruiting, um, basically uh, from Texas on out to Japan. So that's uh, in a nutshell. I, I know you, you probably wanted the thirty second version of what I what I do or what I brought, but uh, wow, you know, what are what thirty one years? No, that's perfect. That's <laughs> that's perfect, man. Uh, and I know you two thousand eight. You first Cobb tour is that about right? That's right. So what's, and you, then you went to the uh, installations where you were uh, above the water being a command master chief. <laughs> yeah. Right. So what, 
I know in the in the submarine force, and I, I've never been stationed on one. I have been on tenders. So I've I've been on submarines, and I've helped calibrate some of their equipment. But it's a you don't have a lot of resources, right? First of all, you can't check your email unless you're Periscope depth. So you go days without even knowing. You could be in a get a fight with your old lady over email, and, you, and they don't get your response until a week later. That's right. That's you right. Know, it's, it's crazy. So you got to be on your toes as a as a chief of the boat on those things compared to the a CNC of a, a of a installation or or a ship. Yeah, I I'd say uh, we we have to. You want to talk about email? We have to carefully monitor the email that comes on and off the ship. And I know you know we don't want to talk about uh, filtering out or um, editing our emails. The sailors will get their unedited email. We just have to. Sometimes we have to find the right time to deliver that email because it could impact our operation. You know, keeping a clear mind on on your watch station has got to be at the forefront of of you know, your 24 hour day on a submarine. So you, know, you get those dear John letters, you know, you get that fight with the wife and that's going to distract you from your job. You may have to, you know, as a chief of the boat, you might have to work with the executive officer and commanding officer and say, Hey, you know, now is not the right time for this sailor to get this email. Um, it's going to cause a, a distraction. And, you know, when you're operating greater than 400 feet below the sea, uh, one mistake could, could end up, you know, the lives of 130 sailors. So, uh, you know, talk about leadership and applying that and like figure out what the, when the right time is um, and then delivering that information and having the, the plan. Once we deliver this information, that sailor is going to want to go home. And what do you have to do? You know, what are all the logistics that come behind that email? Um, and, you know, how is it going to affect not just that sailor, but 130 other sailors? Um, so it's, it's tricky, um, and you definitely got to stay on your toes and 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 and, and monitor those those communications and, and making sure that your your sailors um, are all clear uh, in their mental health state. That's heavy, that's man. We talk about you know anchors are heavy and all of this stuff, but that's heavy. Knowing that information about your sailor and saying I got to hold it for the for the mission of the you know for the mission. Uh, and and for the lives that are on board and then I still I know I have to deliver this and when is the right time and one time I, I had an admiral that I worked for one time he said sometimes being a leader is figuring out where to poke the balloon so that you have the least amount of impact or <laughs> implosion and that, that that's kind of what you had to deal with there it is absolutely um, it's it's tough you know, you talk about being an intrusive leader. This takes it to a whole new level because you do know everything about every single one of your sailors. You have to, because if you don't and you don't care, um, bad things are going to happen and mm -hmm. you just got to stay ahead of it. I can't imagine that. You know, I've been in chief since 2011, but that's a different level. You know what I mean? Yeah. That is a different level where you're like, hey, I don't know if this kid can get this email right now. <laughs> you yeah. know, that's a lot of... yeah. That's a lot of weight on, on that individual's shoulders that has to make that decision. Yeah, and then you know, and then so you know the information, you're yeah. underway, you're in your daily watch routines and your watch station, and you see that sailor, and you know, you want to tell them, it's like, man, I got a secret. Shh, what, what do I do with this information? It's like, Shimei, how you doing today? How's things? You know, when's the last time you heard from home? You know, how are you feeling? Uh, knowing damn well I've got information to give to that sailor but i can't do it right now i mean it's hard and it is heavy absolutely yeah. but other things like you know on a ship you've got a career counselor you've got you know you got a chaplain you got a lot of things on those surface fleets or on an installation that you don't have on the submarine force so i know as the cob you got to wear a lot of damn hats yeah so you got to have a little bit of knowledge about a lot of different things right that, that's right. You know, the CMCs and COBs, we, we go through the same exact training. The only differences between COB and a CMC is the ship's handling characteristics. And, you know, we're the bosun's mate when we're topside, when we're, when we're, you know, maneuvering in and out of port. The COB is the, the man in charge topside or the person in charge topside. Um, and we've never been to bosun mate school. So, you know, it's, it's learn as you go, OJT. But you're absolutely right. When it comes to a chaplain, we don't have a chaplain either. Uh, we do have our career counselors, but they're normally, you know, a senior first class, let's say a sonar tech or an FT or ET um, that are out of rate and they're doing it as a collateral duty 
So the cob really has to have that CCC level of knowledge uh, in order to make those programs survive. Um, so yeah, I used to joke um, earlier when I was when I, when I was just a cob um, that you know a, co a CMC has people has the resources a cob. <laughs> you guys there? I see you guys. I don't. I don't. I don't hear you. Okay. Okay. Can you hear us? Yeah. Got okay. you five by five. So the uh, the last thing we heard was a CMC has resources in a cob, and then we it went it went silent. So you were talking about differences between CMC and cob. Oh, it's frozen again. I got you now. Oh, mine, okay. uh, I don't know if it's you guys or mine. Mine was acting up earlier today, but it looks like I'm okay for now. Yeah, it's saying our internet is unstable, which is so strange. Oh, yeah, the kids are playing games. Okay. <laughs> Bandwidth hogs. Yes. So the, uh, that's what we'll pick up after uh, we'll, the differences between a CMC and, and COM. Okay, did you, did you hear me say that the COM has people? I mean, the CMC has people and the COM doesn't? Yes, yeah, well, people. we heard uh, the CMC has resources, and then that okay. was the last thing we heard. Okay, gotcha. And it might be because they they download so much stuff up there. I don't know <laughs> what they're downloading on Fortnite. Every time Caleb started, he's like, hey, dad, dad, is it payday yet? And he, <laughs> he wants him to buy him V-Bucks and all of this oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, he's like, yep. I know y'all get paid two times a month. So is it oh. this week? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm telling him about Caleb knows our payday. Hell yeah, he's ridiculous. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> All right. So I should, hopefully that fixes. I don't know why. We should, be, we should be able to stream like 20 different items on this internet. I don't know why it's like stupid. Yeah, that's that's how we are. I got Marcy has the one gig service for, mm -hmm. for her work so that. She doesn't. Uh, well, you you remember <laughs> the mm -hmm. struggles in Kingsville trying yeah. to get fast fast internet in Kingsville was like two fifty six. <laughs> yeah, that was that was blazing. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that, man. You were you were in some good conversation. All of a sudden, the uh, Wi Fi took a dump. So okay. yeah, uh, so we're just gonna. I already told him the last thing we heard. We'll just pick it up and I'll edit it all together, and we'll it'll be like nothing ever happened. Okay. So am I talking or are you guys talking? You were talking okay. about okay. the difference between COGS and CMCs. Okay. So uh, we just want to get back into uh, COGS and CMCs. You know, when I was a younger COG um, coming up, you know, I, I used to joke about, you know, CMCs and, you know, the differences between COG and CMC. Um, our qual cards are exactly the same. The only difference is, is a cob has to really get into the ship's handling characteristics and all that other stuff, topside handling. Um, and so the joke was that CMC had people, they have the resources where the cob is the people. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we are the ones that, that had to, to serve as the bosun mate when we're topside, um, you know, never, never having formal training other than the OJT, you know, learn from the, from the guy before you um, and going up and, and becoming the expert of, of handling the ship topside uh, and below. And then, you know, we don't have a chaplain. So lending that ear and, and, and serving as a chaplain, you know, we have a corpsman, we've got a, one corpsman, the IDC that, uh, you know, doc is is all things corpsman and chaplain and the cmc or the cob is the backup uh, when you're underway uh, and then you know other things like career counselors we, i know we talked about that earlier um, that's the collateral duty for a submarine um, first class is usually a senior first class maybe even a second class 
um, that's going to serve as a career counselor, but they're very limited. They, they went to the school, but their primary tasking underway is to focus on, you know, sonar, fire control, electronics. Um, so the cop has to have that CCC level of knowledge. And again, I never, I never went to career counselor school. So I had to OJT learn as I go. And, you know, what's a career development board and how often do I have to do these? And, and, you know, what's important to talk about at these career development boards. So, uh, it, it's definitely hard. And yeah, how do you, <laughs> I can't say now that, you know, that I'm any less intrusive, um, maybe it's because I, you know, I came up as a cop. Um, but I, I know plenty of CMCs out there that, that never served on submarine and, you know, their, their give a crap factors just as high as mine when it comes to, you know, all the sailor programs. How do you deal with all of that? How do you balance uh, all of that weight on your shoulders that you have to carry as a cob and knowing everything you need to know about your sailors and including all of the additional career, uh, you know, cu curricular, extracurricular um, stuff that you have to have, plus, you know, the, the job. How do you balance all of that? Uh, it's you, you get a you have to have a battle rhythm your daily routine. It's like what time am I going to get to the boat in the morning and what am I going to do first? You know, uh, you start with talking to your sailors as soon as you get there and finding out what's the what's the biggest thing. There, the, the the funny thing about a, a cob schedule and it, this and, and maybe it was just mine. I can't speak for everybody, but my schedule was there is no schedule, right? Mm. Who's Who's hurting the most right now? Who do I need to go pay attention to? Um, and sometimes uh, I might have to, def if we're in port, if we're lucky enough to be in port, I can, I can defer those to you know, a professional counselor, a chaplain, uh, the corpsman, um, so that I can do other stuff, like make sure that the maintenance is, getting up, is, is, is happening on the boat, that we're getting you know, all the pre-underway checks and, and doing all the other stuff, looking at watch bills and manning uh, and getting all that stuff done. So. It, it is a lot, um, but, you know, as you're going through that quad card, it really does prepare you um, to handle it and figure out your battle rhythm on a daily basis on how to how to handle all that. Uh, you know, I think for me personally, uh, it's just what I love to do. It's who I am as a person. You know, every ship or every command that you might go to in the Navy, Air Force, across the services, Every commanding officer is going to have their philosophy, their their mission, their vision, their guiding principles. This is how I'm going to run my command. As a cob uh, or a CMC, it's imperative that you have your own personal philosophy and and you tie those two together. Is how am I as a human being going to support my CO? How am I as a leader going to support the mission of this of this command? Um, and you know, I talk about it every everywhere I've ever been uh, since I since I started out as a cop. Uh, my philosophy um, is is a very simple one. Uh, there's four four parts to it, four pillars. Um, it's an acronym, and I, I like to I like to to always talk about it. Is is you know we'll take this back to caveman days, right? Mm -hmm. So, what was the most important tool for a caveman? Fire. It was fire. That's right. He needs to serve with me, right? So he knows the right answer. He already knows the already answer. answer. That's, that's <laughs> not fair. He knew the answer to the <laughs> test. <laughs> right. But, but fire is the most important tool for the caveman, right? It provided heat. Uh, it was a you know, heat source to cook their food, to keep them warm, um, to, to light up their caves. Just versatile, versatile, versatile part of, of their life. Um, we, we take that to modern days and we're still reliant on fire. Um, I know, you know, the e Elon Musk's and the, and the tech world will, will disagree with me because, you know, electric vehicles are taking over my, my, uh, my synonyms or <laughs> I forget the <laughs> word for it, but, but uh, another way of saying this, but, you know, fire is what propels me because I'm a dinosaur, right? My, my 1982 Jeep CJ7 is still operated on fire, right? Combustion engine. Right, so right. that fire is what you know, I'm dependent on it daily to get me to work, to get me to go get the groceries, to cook my groceries, right? Because I don't believe in electric stove. I got a gas stove, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm ancient. I get it. I'm not with the times. But what I'm getting at, and, and I'm rambling on about fire and how important it is, 
is I've used this word, and I don't know if you guys caught that caught it earlier when I was talking about what my dad's profession was as a firefighter. Mm. Um, I just I just tied it all together. Um, and to me, fire is not just a word that symbolizes, you know, heat, smoke, and, um, you know, p- potential energy. For me, FIRE is an acronym. It stands for Family, Integrity, Respect, and Education. That's who I am as a human being, as a person, and I've learned that. Um, and it took a good 20 years for me to really get grasp what, and, and build my philosophy on, like, what really makes me uh, want to do this job? Um, and, it, and I came up with fire. The F family, that's us. That's all of us. You know, uh, before we even started this, when we, we just started, a, you know, started our, our video chat, um, you know, I said, you guys are family. And I, and I really do mean that. Um, anybody that comes into my life and um, I, I'm, I get to operate day to day, you know, in this environment, you can't say, oh, just a shipmate or just a coworker. Mm-hmm. Uh, because if you do, then you don't get to, to have that intrinsic level of leadership that you need or intrusive le- level of leadership that you need uh, in order to take care of them. There's nothing that I wouldn't do for you guys that I wouldn't do for my wife or my, my kids um, because I feel that strongly about what I do as a leader uh, in the Navy. You guys are my family. And I always, I love our NWUs. I wish I was wearing them today, but you know, the, over your right side, that's, your family name, those are the people um, that are bragging about you at the coffee shop back home. Uh, that's who you represent. <laughs> and then on the left side, you know, that other name, Kate, it says U.S. Navy. That's all of us. That's that's my other family. So um, yeah. when I say brother or sister, I'm not just saying that because that's what we say. We're brothers in arms or, 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 or family in arms um, in the armed forces. No, that's because I really believe that that you are my, my family and I love you and I'm not afraid to say love, right? There's a lot of leaders out there, men especially, especially that, that are allergic to the word love. Well, that's not me. Um, you know, I, I'll fall back on my, on my faith. Um, you know, faith, hope, and love is what God gave us. And that's, that's who I am as a person. So I'm sorry if I, I go start preaching on you guys. No, but no I just, perfect. I actually, <laughs> you've said it a couple of times. And for our listeners, we, we as sailors, we say it all the time, intrusive leadership. But for our listeners, I'm wondering if you can go a little bit uh, and expand a little bit on that, just to kind of give an idea of what it means to be an intrusive leader. Intrusive to me means knowing everything you need to know about that sale. You, you kind of got to get into their business a little bit. And, you know, you're not going to get that in the civilian world. People are going like, to mind your own business, right? Yes. I, I, I'm, I'm definitely afraid of going to the civilian world and offending somebody when I go to work in a workplace and I say, well, how's your wife and kids? No, but, but really, how are they doing? Because you always get the, the you know, the standard and Mark what's 1 your mod dog's zero name? <laughs> the standard Mark 1 mod zero answer is like, oh, yeah, everything's good. We're good. Right, right. Right, right. It's like, come on, man, bullshit. You know what's going on? How's right. things? Because you come, you're coming to work all poopy pants. Something's going on. What can I help you? Yeah. That ain't going to fly in the civilian world. But in the Navy, we have to, right? Because we're going to mm-hmm. go to sea or we're going to fly um, and, or we're going to go into, you know, combat zone. And if you're heading on right, you know, I'm relying on my shipmate. I'm relying on you guys, my brothers and sisters, to take care of me the way I'm going to take care of you. So intrusive is, is you got to know a little bit. And you've got to be able to open up a little bit um, when you're in our organization. You've got to be able to give a little bit of yourself like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm a little distracted right now by this um, so that people understand that. And then when you open up and you say that, then you're you, in my, my world, I'm a little bit careful when I tell somebody I got some stuff going on at home. Yeah, I'm a little guarded. I'm not going to tell them all the details, but I'm going to let them know that I have an issue. Um, and so that I don't project any any misery or, or my, my own problems mm. on somebody else, right? So I think that's important in, uh, in the intrusive piece. And if you see somebody else that's, that's lashing out that normally is happy-go-lucky, um, you got to be able to get in there and, and find out how to, how to help them. I do love that. And I, and I do believe, you know, we work, so we work to long hours sometimes. So when you talk about the other family, it's, it's, we probably spend as much time with our shipmates as we do with our, our, you know, people that we live with family, blood family, you know, 
So it's so good to have that at the top of your philosophy. And I'm going to speak on behalf of you, Tomas. I was stationed with you. So what he says here is 100%. That's mm -hmm. him in a nutshell. We're not done yet with fire, but for the family part, we I remember coming up and having my weekly Cobb visits and we were stationed <laughs> together. Uh, and we, if, if I was having a crappy day, I told him everything about it. Yeah. And vice right. versa. We talked to each other a lot and we always knew what each other were going through. And I've always appreciated that about you. All right. Well, I, 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 <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It, it's hard to take compliments sometimes. Oh, I know. I'm the same way. <laughs> <laughs> I, get, I get them so often. It's hard for me. I, I should be used well, to I it. know. For you, I mean, it's, it's the hair that's always going to get you your compliments. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you got some pretty hair. Thank so, you. Oh, gosh. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it real. Let our bromance get in the way. I know. All right. <laughs> okay. Integrity. Let's move on to integrity. All right. Integrity. You know, um, I always like to use the Mark One Mod Zero um, phrase. Um, we go to boot camp. Um, you know, for those people that don't know what integrity is, or they think they know, um, and there's a lot of people that don't know what the word means. When you get to boot camp, you get a certain level of um, expectation on, on that word. Um, and it's a shame that it doesn't show up in the Sailor's Creed. You know, that's always been a, one of my heartaches is why isn't the word integrity True. built into our Sailor's hmm. Creed? I mean, that is to me is so fundamentally and foundationally, that is the foundation of, of who we are. Integrity, the Mark 1 Mod Zero answer in boot camp is it's doing the right thing when nobody else is watching. Right. That's what integrity is. Um, but we got to take it deeper. It's who are you personally? And hey, not just personally. Um, but professionally, where's your level of integrity? You got to be the same person on duty as you are off duty um, because, you know, you're going to train how you fight and fight how you train. Um, so if you're not training at the right level all the time, then your, your integrity is not going to be where it needs to be. Um, and I think to, to me, um, my biggest pet peeve as a, as a cob or a CMC uh, is when somebody does something incredibly stupid, they violate their integrity or they compromise their integrity and do something, the wrong thing. Um, maybe they like, I'm tired. You know, I can't, I'm too tired to stand this watch. So I'm just going to go hide behind this piece of equipment and take a quick 10 or 15 minute nap. Um, and, and you catch them in it and then they don't want to own it. They don't want to own yeah. it. It's like, you should make, <laughs> you got caught. Let's, right. it, it's time to, it's time to buckle up and, you know, take ownership of, of your faults. Um, so, you know, I have, I try to maintain the highest level of integrity that I possibly can. I've made a lot of mistakes uh, coming up in the Navy, you know, my E5 years from 1994 to 99, um, you know, I went to campus mass three times in my first year as a second yeah. class. I, thought, I almost, I almost made E4 three times, right? Outlaw, what outlaw? <laughs> I mean, this is, I mean, this is a story for another day, but the, the, the bottom line is if I had not taken ownership of my mistakes, then I would have made E4. But mm -hmm. you know, I want to say the Navy was a little bit different. We're more lenient of stupid crap. Um, but as long as you came forward and said, this is what I did, this is why I did it, I understand it was incredibly stupid. I'll never do it again. And and so if you don't, you self-correct and you and you keep it moving. Um, so that's, I mean. Luckily for me, I, you know, I grew up in the Navy in a, in a time where uh, you could get away with some stuff. Um, but again, you know, a story for another day. I won't go into too much. But integrity, I mean, that's the foundation. You can't have honor, courage, and commitment. You can't if you have no integrity. And that's mm -hmm. why I say, you know, why, why didn't we write this into our Salish Creed yeah. somewhere? It's so true. You know, and, and owning up to your mistakes is... is such a, a mark of respect because like you said a lot of people want to push it on somebody else or not or say I didn't do that or whatever it may be and you actually lose respect for that person like let's say for example you know that they did wrong and then you watch them blame somebody oh, else yeah. or push it on somebody else you lose respect for that leader and as a leader I think that is a top priority and you see this kids with kids a lot that they'll, they'll try to like <laughs> Not take, not take it. I said, well, like, you know, like the, uh, our oldest, he set his alarm and was late for work. And he goes, well, it was just, it snoozed automatically. It's not my fault. The the alarm didn't go off. You I know, like, well, you gotta own it, man. You gotta own that. You screwed <laughs> right. up. That's right. That's 
Right. Exactly. Yeah, but that, I think that's a great, you know, uh, and maybe we should write integrity into the Sailor's Creed since we're changing, you know. So if anybody from Millington, I know you work there, if anybody from <laughs> Millington is listening, we need to make a change. <laughs> we need to make Add integrity that. somewhere because like, I think it's a big just deal. Just do the little uh, correction. Correct, little carrot. Yeah, the, the little carrot and then write integrity in there. I, I agree. Integrity is huge. I mean, because without integrity, how are you going to trust that guy standing watch? That's right. Or a guy next to you in a foxhole or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's it. So, yeah. And uh, I think, again, going back to the philosophy, I think all, all, of, all of my pillars or all of what I think are important are, are just about as equal. Um, but I think the next one that, that I wanted to talk about was respect. Um, that one's huge. And I know you guys have done lots of podcasts here recently on I'm just respect it in itself when it comes to race, religion, sexual orientation, um, political viewpoints. It's just, there's so many different avenues um, that as human beings, we just have to learn to respect each other and, and, and understand that we're just not gonna get along all the time. And that's okay because we have different viewpoints and you know we're brought up in, in different cultural backgrounds and you know, different parts of the world that you know, what's culturally acceptable in one area is not going to be in somewhere else. Um, but you understand that and you educate yourself on that so that you're careful um, and you don't you don't disrespect somebody. Right. Um, and, and, and everything always goes back to family for me. Right. So if you disrespect one of my sailors, one of my brothers or sisters, stand by. Right? Oh, man. Because the big brother's coming. <laughs> that, that's me right um you don't get to disrespect one of my, my my family members you disrespect my family i'm gonna do everything in my power to advise my commanding officer to take your identification card send you to the front gate and stop your pay bye-bye right because i got no no tolerance for it no use for it you don't get to hate me because i'm brown you get to hate me because i'm firm and I'm fair and I told you to do something and you didn't want to do it, but you got to do it anyway. That mm -hmm. That's okay. You could hate me all day long because I told you to do something and you don't agree with it, but it's, it's legal, it's ethical, it's moral, and it's safe. As right. long as I'm doing that, right? You can hate me all day long. Right. Do your job. That's exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. And keep that's the comments to yourself. Exactly. I feel the same way. You know, I'm such a, a calm person and a lot of people have not seen me get mad, but let them do something to mess with my sailors. <laughs> it's either my kids or my sailors. Right. And, and it's like a different level of mad. And they're like, oh, your Mexican is showing. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, man, you just messed with my family. And <laughs> listen, you, you know, all, all hats are off. I'm going in attack mode. Um, but I feel the same way because um, it's, it's, it's who we are as a Navy. It's, it's how close we are in, in the diversity in the Navy. And I say this all of the time is our strength. We right. include everyone because everyone has something to bring to the table and it doesn't matter the color of the skin or their gender or whatever it may be. Uh, winners are winners. And, you know, when, when we combine the the cream of the cream and the in the tip of the top in the navy it we can't we're unstoppable that's right that's right fact <laughs> <laughs> there, there's power in it right um i i'd say one of the biggest disadvantages i had um in the navy growing up you know um, was the fact that i was on all-male crews i um you know, I left the submarine community just as we were starting. Um, we had just started implementing uh, women officers on Trident submarines. Um, mm -hmm. And I was part of the working group for the enlisted women in submarines. So kind of getting together and thoughts and finding all the senior female leaders in the Navy, all the, the, the female mass chiefs and uh, female officers. And like, how can, how can, how do we integrate females into our, in our workforce? Um, and, and what does it look like and how to, you know, besides the logistics, right, with different head and birthing and all that stuff that you give that to the, the shipbuilders and tell them to make it work. It's, it's how do we prepare the crew to start working with females um, and how do we um, prepare the, the spouses to start 
understanding that we're going to have females on submarine um, and, and we're going deep and, and you know, we're going to do all the stuff that we need to do. Um, and how do we all get along in all of that? Um, and I'd say it's a disadvantage for me because it wasn't until I got to Kingsville, Texas, on, as I'm running the installation there, that I'm, you know, I've, I'm working with my first female um, sailors. And I'm nervous. I'm scared. I'm like, oh, what am I, you know, I don't know how to, I don't know how to talk to female sailors. You know, I'm, I'm a master chief. I've been in the Navy at this point, 20, 23, 24 years. Wow. And I'm like, I'm nervous as all hell. And I'm like, what am I, I'm going to say something wrong. I'm going to get fired. You know, you, you see on the Navy times all the time, all these <laughs> that are getting fired for, yeah. you know, fraternization and all this other stuff. Um, and so I had a senior chief, um, air traffic controller there um, oh, yeah. at Kingsville. And I brought her in and I said, Hey, help me out with this. I'm scared. And she's like, obscenity, 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 obscenity. <laughs> we're all, we're all sailors, Master Chief. That's essentially, I'm like, just talk to us like you would anybody else. Don't treat us any differently. I'm like, well, shit, that's easy. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> easy day. Um, and I was able to, to, to get it right. Um, now, again, you know, I might have not been the smartest when it came to, came to female grooming standards is probably something when I, when I took my rating exams that I probably got all those answers wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I got smart over the years. Um, but I guess it all just goes back to, you know, to respect. And there is a huge value in that diversity and, and not just between cultures, but genders, um, mm -hmm. having female and, and, and male crews working together and just, we all think differently. Men and women think so differently that um, you know, I was, I'm, I'm sure our submarine uh, force is, is running so much better than it was 20 years ago, uh, now that we've been integrated women on, on submarines, that you know, we've got just incredibly talented people. Um, and now we're thinking with our right and our left sides of our brain and making, make it a full brain uh, out of the whole, out of the whole picture. So I just, I don't know, I, that's why I say, I, you know, I was so disadvantaged um, mm. at my early years and I'm, I kind of I'm happy with where we, we are today in the Navy when it comes to the sub, our submarine force. Isn't that funny you said something that kind of sparked my interest because you were you said you were afraid and you didn't know how to talk to females and isn't that funny how the majority of the time we find out that the things that we are afraid of is is from our lack of knowledge. So we say, oh, yeah. well, you know, this sailor is from the hood and I didn't live in the hood. I grew up in a small town. So I don't really know how to come to the sailor and speak to them in a way that they would understand me. But at the end of the day, they're just another sailor, another human being, and you just talk to them like a sailor. And yeah, you, they, we never need to fear about coming at, at someone with a different background or culture, whatever, because at the end of the day, we're human beings, you know? That's right. It's treating people with respect, right? Exactly. Treating people, my, you know, the golden rule, treat people the way you want to be treated. Mm -hmm. Domas Garcia's rule, treat people better than you want to be treated. Regardless of whether you call me Master Chief or good morning or, or anything, the, you don't have to address me first. I can say, good morning. How are you doing today? You know, you're looking great, sure, mate. Keep it up. Keep up the good work. Um, but I don't know where I wanted to go with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm still thinking about that conversation that you had with that uh, that that female senior chief. I know who you're talking about. I'm just, it's pictured in my head how it went, because I bet that was hilarious. That if I'd been a fly on the wall, I wish I could have heard that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know exactly. I mean, she retired um, yeah. from me after I got there. But, uh, yeah, she was. she kept it real. She kept it 100. Uh, for sure. And, uh, and you're oh. absolutely right, Jamie, when it comes to, you know, I don't speak Bronx, I can't talk to that person, because I'm from country, you know, uh, I'm from little town, I'm not from inner city. It, you brought up a great point. It's not that fear that I had to talk to female sailors is the same that that so many people struggle with, because, um, you know, I, I never saw a black person in my in my life until I joined the Navy, and I don't know how to talk to them. Um, yeah, they're America. They're, mm -hmm. they're sailors. Talk. Exactly. Just talk. Exactly. 
Exactly. Man, if that's one thing that we could get out to to everyone, and and you know, in the Navy, we we have a, an advantage because uh, we train and we we work closely together. But if we could get that out to the rest of our Americans, you know, our civilians, hey, just talk, just talk, ask questions. If you don't know, don't be afraid. Just talk. Right. You know. But you gotta first give a shit about that person you're working with. You gotta care a little right. bit to want to strike a strive a conversation 100 percent that's true education let's talk about education what, what mm -hmm. comes to mind when 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 i say education what are you guys thinking about you're thinking about college i'm thinking about college go to college got to yeah. got to go to college got to go to this trade school yeah, right, right. Uh, i think those are important i really do family integrity respect and education but to me it ain't about that it's not about college. It's not about that tech school or trade school. I think those are important. You have to have a certain level if you're expecting to, to, to make a certain income um, and you want to live a certain lifestyle. You need that, that degree to, to maybe get you into that next pay grade or that, 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 that pay scale. And God bless you in those tax brackets. But, you know, to <laughs> me, the payoff in education it's all spiritual. It's what am I learning today about Jamie and Heath that I didn't know yesterday? What did I, what am I learning about you to make myself a better person? Because you guys are outstanding Americans. I love you to death. And just hearing the way you think gives me something else. So another tool in my tool bag to think of things and look at things in a different perspective that's gonna make me a better human being. And hopefully it makes me a better leader. But my overall goal in life is not to be a better leader as it is to be a better person. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know I can get back up and preach. I wanna be a, a man of God. I wanna, I wanna be the best person of the best, um, I lost it, but I wanna be the best version of myself as I possibly right. can. Um, and I can't do that if I'm so closed off and I'm not continuously learning something new or, 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 or challenging myself to learn something new about somebody today that's going to make me a better person um, and, and hopefully turn that into a better leader. Uh, so that's what the education piece to me is. Uh, again, you know, nothing to say anything bad about formal education. I think it's important as well. I just, um, it's, to me, it's all about being a better person, better human being. You know, I had a chief um, when I first got into the Navy, and he would always say the most dangerous air traffic controller is the one that thinks they knows everything, or the ones they think they know everything. And it's the one that stops studying, stops getting in the manuals, just controls on their knowledge because everything in air traffic control is evolving, and everything in our Navy is evolving, everything in our world is evolving. And when you stop and you limit and you quit learning, that's when you become dangerous because you're working on the past knowledge or the way things used to be. And that's a dangerous Navy. It's a dangerous leadership style and a dangerous world to live in. Right. That's right. And, yeah. And, and what you said about, like what you said about knowing a little bit more about that person today, whatnot, because it's hard to practice empathy if you don't know that person that well. Right. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, in your honor, Tomas, we're going to do uh, after this, we're going to do a little history on a on a on a submarine. Uh, you might know it, the USS Thresher. OK. Yeah. And about how what great the tragedy, what great things came out of that tragedy, basically. So I, I knew about it. I was I was on the uh, tender and they, they beat it in their head about sub safe and all that stuff. But when you I actually researched it and actually learned about it, you, I was able to put myself there almost and really appreciate the sacrifices those, those guys made, which made it a safer subforce for the rest of us. That's right. Really, it was, uh, and I didn't really understand. Yeah, yeah, it was, a, it was a submarine until I really got in there and learned something. Mm -hmm. You learn something, you appreciate more of it, whether it be things or people or, or what. Right, that's right. So, so there, you know, oh, go ahead, sorry. I was just thinking, you know, another way of, of, of thinking about the education piece is what, it, what am I going to learn today to motivate myself to motivate others? 
Yeah. Right? And we could talk about the thresher. You know, I can talk sub safe all day long with you uh, and how critical it was. And um, unfortunately, you know, we, it took a tragic event of you know, the lives of sailors to, to, to make a program um, so intrusive that uh, we're not going to repeat those, those critical errors. Right. Yep. And you know, that is just the, the, the charge of leadership, honestly, <laughs> if for lack of a better term, but it's the charge of leadership, everything that every policy that we have made, every instruction that has been written, unfortunately has been written in blood and lessons learned. And until that tragic, whatever it may be has happened or mistakes were made, we have nothing to go on. And, it, you know, it's just going back to this uh, last year with the pandemic, nobody knew this was uncharted territory for everybody. And we made a lot of mistakes and we did a lot of things wrong. And now we know what we, you know, after action 2020, hindsight 2020, we know what to do next time. But until the situation happens and, you know, it, sometimes you find yourself in uncharted territories with as a leader, you know. Right. Right. Yeah. So everybody, there we have it. We have Tomas Garcia's secret of his life, secret his secret of his success. <laughs> it's uh, four, fire. four little letters, one common word, fire. So correct me. I'm gonna try to recite it for you because you know when I would fill in for you for Command Master Chief when you would take leave once in a while. <laughs> Can we give this. Speech? I would try to give it because I'm like, dude, you need to. I'm like, dude, you you deserve to hear this. <laughs> But I think I did all right. I didn't do as good as you. I mean, I'd have a I have a cheat sheet. Oh. So I would when I do a check in, I had to look at it. Okay, that's what I'm gonna do. I wouldn't forget it because I didn't do it all the time. I just right. I was a like a guest commentator. Yeah, he would tell me yeah. I'm gonna do Tomas's speech, and I'm like, well, <laughs> a fire speech. The fire, fire speech. speech. So you know, <laughs> well, I'll just I'll just put this analogy because I don't think you you uh, you mentioned it, but the fire is the basis of everything that a sailor is, right? We are all basic firefighters. You yeah, get it? Yeah, fire. Yeah. Oh, I like it. I like yeah, it. That's yeah. true. That's true. Down to the core. Down. You got you got down to the nuts and bolts, baby. Nuts and bolts of who we are <laughs> as it's sailors. It's all about the damage controls. What yeah, right. <laughs> so fire. So we got family. Then you got the I, integrity, R, respect, E, education. I get it? That's it. She nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> that's it. Then that was the, how he gave the speech. No, that's when not he how it is. <laughs> There's a little more than that. I broke out the name tape and stuff. Make, when you meet the CMC, just, just be able to say fire. That's it. He'll, he'll, he'll smile here to here. I'll know you've got it. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, I'm the CMC, so nobody's going to talk. There's junior guys. They're not going to say anything. Yeah. yeah. Yes, CMC or yes, CMG. That's all they say. <laughs> and then they scratch their heads yeah. as they walk out. And they talk to their sponsor. What the hell did he just say? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you some questions real quick. So, what are some characteristics that you've seen coming up as a young ET3 Garcia up to Command Master Chief that some characteristics of good sailors that, that makes you like almost like, damn, I wish I could be like that person? Um, you know, the, 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 core attributes, you can be on time, look good, do your damnedest. Um, those are, that's always what I, I looked for uh, when I was trying to, to, to find a mentor or emulate. Um, and I found that in, in pretty much every one of my chiefs that I had growing up, but it was, it was the fact that they were always looking to, to find what else needs to be fixed. At, to continue and asking the whys and why is this broken? How did it break? And, and really getting down to the nit and gritty of, of, of everything that they do. So those, those attributes of the leader, you know, is firm, fair, first, um, are, are some of the, the biggest things that, 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 that kind of just resonated to me um, about, about the Chiefs that, that I, I really want to emulate. You know, Mike, Mike Cobb on Seawolf, uh, Dean Irwin, he, he went on to be the force, um, submarine force master chief before he retired. Uh, you know, I just, I idolized that guy. You know, there was nothing that, that he couldn't do um, or, or kind of explain um, that just it captured me. And, you know, when, it, when we're, we're living in a generation now where your sailors, they want to know the why, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just do as I say, um, because I said it. Now it's more of a, hey, you got to explain it. You got to give them a little bit of the why. And once you do that, you get the buy-in. 
um, and you know that you get a little bit of ownership in whatever they're doing because they, they get behind it. So that that to me was was always um, something I look for is is if I'm going to have a chief or a leader out there that's going to get up in front of me and tell me to do something, it gives me just a little bit of why I should give a shit, why I you know I should own this this problem or this program or or whatever. It just it made me have pride through ownership, um, and that's just that's what I look for um, whenever I, you know, look for a powerful leader is, is somebody that could that really get up there and, and be the coach uh, more than um, a director. Right. What, what now, now that you're, <clears throat> you've been a CMC slash Cobb for since the last 12, 13 years, what at that time, what have you seen that really pissed you off leadership, uh, what leaders do, characteristics leaders do that makes you want to grab them up by the crowd and say, what the hell do you think? <laughs> Oh man, anything that's contrary to good order and discipline, um, mm. you know, it, it, it's drunk and disorderly. You know, what really pissed me off in a, in a chief's mess is, is a, a sloppy, a sloppy chief thing. You go out there, um, you know, you've probably been to a few khaki balls where the chiefs just get incredibly stupid. It's like, why, why are you doing this? We've got an example to set. Yeah. Uh, subordinates are looking at us. You know, we're, we're trying to change the direction that the chief petty officer is going. We're not, we're not that old drunk chief's quarter chief anymore. We're, we're the guy that's out on the deck plate leading the way um, and setting the example. So when, when I come across those, it, it, that really irritates me. Um, and then, you know, the, the ones that aren't going to, that don't want to be held accountable, um, the, the ones that don't have integrity that, or that they're going to lie. Talk about something that's going to piss me off um, <laughs> is lie to me. Mm -hmm. I dare you. Lie to me. Because if I find out, and you know me, Heath, it's like I am a very loving and gullible person. I am very gullible. You tell me um, that the sky is red, I'm going to believe you. Why? Because I... I trust that your level of integrity is as high as mine, if not better. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. But as soon as you lie to me and I find out, because it's probably going to be somebody like Heath stood next to me, like, hey, Tomas told us that. That dude's full of shit. Right? He's lying. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm like, oh, oh, yeah, he is. Wow. Right? Why would he do that? What kind of sailor is would do something like this? And that, that irritates me. Uh, any you know, liar who just I, I can't tolerate it. I like that because he tells me all of, all the time you have to trust your sailors until they give you a reason not to, and and that to to them is everything. That trust up front right. is everything because they have given you no reason to not trust them. So you know they say they're sick. Well, believe them. They're sick. You know, uh, until they give you a reason not to. But if you're they're sick, and then uh, a couple hours later, I go walk past some basketball course and out there playing b ball, <laughs> playing pickup game, then yeah. we got a problem. <laughs> then you got a problem. I'm but... gonna embarrass them in front of the little buddies, but <laughs> that's right, that's absolutely right, absolutely right. <laughs> but I, I've always felt that look. If they say they're sick, they're sick until they give me a reason not to believe. That's just right. that's just how I was. That's how people treated me. That's how I treated them. Benefit of the doubt. Yeah. That's a doubt. I, I'm not going to go in there, you know, and probably one of the things that, that kind of upsets me the most is when you're getting to a new command and somebody tries to paint the picture for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can't mm -hmm. trust this person. That person's a liar. This person run around on their spouse. So whatever. Um, stop. I don't want to yeah. hear it. Right. I don't want to hear mm -hmm. it. You know, you're, you're, you're tainting my view. I'm going to come in with rose colored glasses. Everything is perfect. Leave, leave it alone until that person gives me a reason to not trust them and not believe them, then they're going to have a hard time gaining my trust back because it's going to be a long time, if, if not at all. Um, this, but as long as as a leader, you're up front with that. And that's what I loved about, love about our INDOC program. When I get in front of our sailors, I give them the fire speech. Um, and part of that integrity speech is don't ever give me a reason to question your integrity because once I do, once I do, I am not going to trust you at all. If you want to gain it back, you're going to have to work hard. And there's a very good chance that I'm going to transfer before you get it back. Right. Wow. So it's easier to keep my trust than to earn it back. That's right. It's a lot That's easier. Right. That's wow. right. That's good insight. Yeah. And that's pretty much a lot of people I know. Mm -hmm. Most leaders, decent, badass leaders I know, they're, they're trusting people, but don't, don't 
piss up. Don't be given a reason not to trust you. Yeah. It's a common. It's common. But you got to give them that warning shot, right? Right. If they don't know you, you don't know them. But if I'm in charge, hey, let me, I'm going to give you my expectations. Expectations. You got to drop it. Yep. So, <laughs> you know, I've, before we break off here, I was going to tell you, you know, that my family is from Bishop, Texas, too. I my dad, not, my no, dad is from Bishop. My grandma grew up there. Last name Salazar. East side or west side? I don't know. Actually, I think sure. honestly, I think the house that you know, Bishop dad, is so big, east side, yeah, west side. Yeah, yeah I know. I know. Right? Across, <laughs> it's across. I didn't Street. even know there was an east side or west side. But. Which side of the basketball courts? You know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think her dad actually at one time lived in your parents' house. Is that right? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Wow. That's when, he, cool. when he when he first moved to Bishop from uh, Las Cruces. We're probably um, cousins, Jamie. Prob <laughs> we probably are because my gram my grandma my great grandmother lived in Bishop um, until she had passed away in uh, the nineties, I believe. I can't remember exactly. I was young, but yep, she lived there in Bishop for her whole life. And and with the last name Salazar, my grandma's from there, and then they moved to Corpus, Flower Buff. I'm sure. I'm sure my parents know your your grandparents or your parents. <laughs> yeah, it's a right, it's small, such town. A small town. It is. Such a, a small town. That's funny. East side or west side? <laughs> but, but it was funny. You said I'm from Bishop, Texas, which is uh, not far from Kingsville, and everybody's like, "Where the hell's Kingsville?" <laughs> <laughs> Forty miles south of Corpus. They can Google that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we just appreciate seeing you again and, and getting catching up and, you know, just for you to open up and provide that insight for us because um, leadership is heavy and, and you, you just, you just with your words, you, you helped us to understand yeah. that perspective. And I, I truly appreciate what you do out there in, in the cops and the CMCs. And now we can better understand from their point of view, the, the weight when we right. say the weight right. of the of the anchor or the stars or whatever you want to say, um, we understand what comes along with that. Because we talked about it earlier, another episode. Uh, well, uh, the last one we did. You don't necessarily get. You're not necessarily have the maturity of charges. They you're 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 doing it. They make you do this, whether it be your rank. Just because you have a rank doesn't mean you have the maturity all the time. So it's a charge. Hey, you right. made first class. You've been in Navy five years, but you're first class now. So step it up. Mm -hmm. You're in, you're in charge now. You know, so it's a charge, but don't, don't let it fool you. It's a charge. And either some people are ready for it, some people ain't. Hopefully, you know, in those few years, you got enough kicks in the ass to, to help you uh, do a good job when it's your turn, you know? So what with that, um, what would be one thing that you would like to leave our, the listeners with that, you know, are taking on that next level? And maybe they don't feel ready to be that leader or to hold that weight. What piece of advice could you leave with them? I'd say, you know, we could, we, I could quote John F. Kennedy, you know, ask not what you could do for your country, but what you can do for your, I'm sorry, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, right? Um, to, to me, the biggest reward and that return on the investment that I was talking about earlier, but, you know, when you talk about paydays and all that other stuff, what's my return on investment? Your return on investment as a leader is helping to develop your relief, your subordinate sailors to, you know, and encourage them to relieve you someday. Um, you, you know, your, your payment, your payout for all of your hard work is seeing that light bulb come on and somebody get a genuine love for the duty that they're that they're that they're performing a lot of the times you know we, we lose sight of why we joined the navy in the first place you know maybe maybe it was just for college i get it but for so many people that join the military it's to, to be a part of something bigger than themselves you hear that a lot well if you truly want to be a part of better something bigger than yourself then get out there and lead it and 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 enjoy that return it's hard work and, you know, it, it don't pay near as much as it should, in my opinion, but the pay is pretty good. Yeah, um, it's not bad. But you can't do it for that reason. You got to do it because you really love watching your sailors grow. Um, and 
that love that you have for people. If you don't have that love for people, then you're in the wrong business. Go, you know, stay in your rate. Um, be a technical expert. Um, but if you've got that love in your heart and you want to further develop sailors um, and, and watch them grow and get, you know, max out as high as they can possibly go um, and continue to encourage them, then, then this, this level of leadership is the right place for you. Wow. Right. That's, that's, you put it perfectly. That's great. Well, thanks so much for coming on with us. We appreciate everything that you brought to the table and uh, hopefully we can uh, do you justice with our next segment because yeah. he did the research <laughs> on the thresher. So we'll see. Uh, oh, I know what we forgot to ask. What's that? Why are you a submariner? Oh. Okay. Well, no, why is it? Okay. Why do submariners? get offended when they're called submariners <laughs> um it's not all and it, i'd say so why, okay, why does tomas garcia get offended when we say submariners? <laughs> uneducated submariners right i'm gonna educate my submarine brothers and sisters out there if you are okay with being called a submariner then should make you need to do your homework <laughs> a submariner implies that you're less than a mariner Oh. Right. It, 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 it's it's your mariner. What's a mariner? A mariner is a sailor, right? So if I'm saying right. I'm a submariner, then I'm I'm less than a mariner, right? The Brits right. are okay with it. That's the you know the British. They they say submariner yeah. all the time. They they do. I operate a submarine for a living, or I did operate a submarine for a living. So therefore, I am a submariner because that's what I do. Got it. And what hey, what is to a what do y'all, what do submariners call fleet surface ships? <laughs> targets. Targets. <laughs> skimmers, I, targets. I like it. Yeah, skimmers, skimmers. I don't recognize you unless I do like this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Anyway, I, I, so uh, real war ships can go underwater and, re, and resurface. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you as so long much. As, for as, your, as long as your number of surfaces matches your number of dives, you're doing okay. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Man, thanks so much, bro. I appreciate you coming on with us. Uh, I know it took me a little talking, talking into you a little bit, talking into it, man, but it was great. great. Perfect. Nailed it. Appreciate it. I, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Hang out for a minute. When we stop this recording, we'll, we'll BS for a sec. Got it.